Thank you, Dave. Good morning again, everyone. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, I thank you for that song. Dave's right. It really, truly says it all. The name of Jesus is the most beautiful word on our lips. There's nothing more that we could say that we're missing when we say his name. For he's the creator of it all. He's the one for which we gathered in this place to worship his name. And I pray that he would be glorified now in the preaching of his word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you were here last week, then you'll remember, I focused the majority of our time on a single theological word. It's a legal word. It's the word justification. If you were here, I explained what that word means. Uh, But in case you weren't, Let me help you to understand it. As I was walking out the door uh, after we'd finished the service yesterday, or last week, uh, Laura Pagenkoff came up to me and she said, when I was young, I grew up listening to my Sunday school teachers teach me about that word, and they had a way to help us little ones remember it. And so I thought, this week I'm going to remember to say it. Justified means, some of you will know this, God sees me just as if I'd never sinned. If you've never heard that, that's a really good way to remember what justified means. That because of what Jesus did on the cross, God, when I stand before him on my day, whenever that day comes, I can know that I will be cleared of all the charges against me, just as if I'd never sinned, which is a glorious truth. It's what sets the Christian gospel apart from every other religious system of the world. That's what last week's message was all about. If you were here, you'll remember that we don't have a religion. If you're a Christian, a Christ follower, you need to know that. We don't have a religion. What we have, look, is a completed religion. What I said last week was that religion aims to stack up all of your good works So that when you stand before God, you'll be able to say, here's what I've done. Am I good enough to get into heaven? And we said last week that it doesn't matter if you had five million lifetimes, you could never stack up a good enough works because the standard is perfection. And unless you meet moral perfection, you don't make the cut. That's what all religious systems aim to do. Help you to be a good person. He is our finished religion. Is everybody with me? That's what we finished up with. That was all of last week's sermon done in about 60 seconds. Here's why I uh, refreshed your memory on that. I want to take you a little bit further now, okay? I want to continue that theological train a little bit further down the path. And I want you to imagine something with me, okay? Imagine that last week was the first time you'd ever heard the gospel. I know some of you have been Christians for 70, 80 years, but I want you to pretend with me for a moment that you haven't been. Now, last Sunday, you heard the gospel, the message that God can legally dismiss your case, your whole file full of crimes against his law on the basis of the great and perfect life of Jesus Christ, whom he says he'll give it to you as if it was your own life. Imagine that you heard that for the first time and it changed your heart. And in that moment, you committed your life to God. Here's what happens in that moment. According to the Bible, the moment you become a Christian, something changes inside your heart. You become a new creation. You can't see it, but it's happening according to the Bible. God changes a person's heart on the inside. The moment they say, yes, I recognize I'm a sinner, and then if I died, I would need to stand before God and I'd have nothing to show for it. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The moment that happens... Something changes, and it continues to change for the rest of your life. If that happened to you last week, which I'm saying, let's pretend it has happened to all of us, when you walked out the door on Sunday last week, what would be the next thought on your mind? You'd probably be thinking, now what? Now that I'm a Christian, does anything change? Or do I just go on with my life, business as usual? Does anything change about me? Now that I've become someone who says, I've put my life in the hands of Jesus Christ. And the answer is, absolutely yes. When someone becomes a Christian, everything changes about that person. Not all at once, but gradually over time. 
So this morning, what I want to ask Jesus is what does that look like for a person once they've been called justified, made right with God? What does a justified life look like? Wouldn't you all like to know that? If someone is made right with God, what should their life look like from that point forward? Let's ask another question. Was there a picture in the, in the Gospels that Jesus pointed to and said, that's it. That's the picture of what it looks like when someone goes on after they've been forgiven. Can you think of a story that Jesus told that showcased a person who was forgiven and what their life looked like afterwards? Oh, I can. There's one really, really good story that Jesus told as it was happening to say, that's what a justified person looks like. And he told us this story so that the thousands of years that would happen after he had already ascended to the Father, preachers would come and they'd say, this is what life will look like after you've been saved. So this morning, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 7. If you don't have a Bible, there's one right in front of you underneath or underneath your seat. Or if you don't have a Bible, you can just follow along with us up on the screen. The words will be portrayed up there too. Here's what you need to know as you turn there. As you turn there, we're going to be reading about a prostitute. Now, if you remember last week, we talked about how Jesus said the lowest rung of the moral ladder, someone who's at the very, very bottom, someone who's really immoral, was like a tax collector. In those days, Jewish people saw tax collectors as like the bottom of the barrel. Like you wouldn't want to hang out with a tax collector. That's who Jesus says, yes, that's the one that can be saved. Well, today... We thought we reached the bottom of the moral barrel last week. Well, Jesus says, no, we're going to use a prostitute as the example of somebody who can be saved. And this is like mind boggling to the high religious leaders of the day who think that they're so hot stuff because they've got the Bible memorized, their Bible. So that's what we're going to look at today. As we read this story, I want you to ask one question. Here's the question. What does a forgiven person whose heart has been touched by the grace of God, look like? Keep that in your mind as we read this account together, okay? Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. Follow along. One of the Pharisees asked him, Jesus, to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. And behold, a woman of the city, that means a prostitute, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment and standing behind him at his feet, weeping. Please picture this in your mind. Weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and she wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, Simon is the name of the Pharisee, not Simon Peter, so don't get confused. Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house you gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, listen closely, church, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, 
Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Isn't that a beautiful story? I love that story. The title I've assigned for this, our 14th message in the new series, Life According to Jesus, is Transformation According to Jesus. Because that's what we're reading about here. A prostitute who is in the process of being made completely new. And we get a picture of what Jesus says it will look like when each one of you is made completely new too. Now the big idea, every message I give a big idea to, it's the main lesson that God intends for us to learn from this passage. This big idea has some big theological words in it. And the reason that I've chosen to put these words in it is because these are the words you're going to find in your Bible. I know that there's a trend that people are, uh, preachers are stopping using big theological words because they're afraid they're going to lose people. But I don't think that's the right way to go. When you get home, I hope you read your Bible on your own. And when you do, you'll find big theological words in it. And if someone doesn't teach you, what do you think you're going to do? You're going to skip over them. So I think this is the right place for us to use those words. Wouldn't you agree? The big idea for today, what Jesus has for us to learn, what he had Simon the Pharisee to learn, is this. According to Jesus... Your faith results in justification. Remember I said what that is? Being made right with God. Your faith results in justification. That produces something. Sanctification. I'm going to explain what that is in just a minute. That results in something else. At the end of your life, a complete transformation. And this woman, this prostitute, is the picture of it all. All in one shot, Jesus is saying, this is is what a Christian looks like. So let's, at the very beginning, here's what I want to do. I want to take a snapshot of this woman and explain some of these things that you see happening to her. Like, at the very, very end, look at that last verse in there. It says that she has faith and that's what saved her. Well, what does faith mean? What does it mean to be sanctified, justified, transformed? I put some definitions for you up on the screen so that we can all be on the same page, okay? Faith, trust in action. Listen, a lot of people say they believe a lot of things, Right? But if there's no action to back up those statements, oh, I believe this, there's no action, they don't really believe it, do they? Faith is trust in action. Can you see action with this woman here? Of her faith? Look what she's doing. Would you ever go into a public scene where dinner is happening at someone else's house and do what this woman did? She's not invited there, but she just walked in and started doing what she did. That's faith in action. The next thing justified, remember, right with God, declared right with God, forgiven. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. So when this woman dies and she stands before God, should she be afraid? No, because Jesus, the authority himself is saying, cleared of charges. How can he say that? He knows what her life has been like. Next, sanctified. That's a complicated word. It simply means, take a look. Becoming holy like Jesus. That's all it means. Becoming more like Jesus. Having your heart match the heart of Jesus. Having your mind match the mind of Jesus. This woman, you can clearly see that she's starting to think like him. You know how I can say that? Who did the foot washing first? She or he? She did. Jesus does it at the end of his life. They're starting to think alike. She's already doing things like Jesus does things. Things that most people would say, ew, that's shameful. Don't wash someone's stinky feet. You could have just walked through camel stuff, right? You're going to put your hair on that? It's shameful. She's starting to think like Jesus. She's being sanctified. Finally, what will be the end result of that beginning process of being changed? At the end result, she's going to become a whole New creature, transformed into something entirely new. That's exactly what the New Testament says happens to somebody who has been saved by faith. They're changed. They look the same on the outside, but little by little, you should start to say, that guy's just not the same. That woman's just not the same. You're seeing this gradually happen. And this woman is the picture of it all. What I want to show you this morning is what Jesus was trying to get Simon to see. Do you realize this whole episode is in the Bible for the sake of Simon? This is an evangelistic pursuit of Simon the Pharisee. Imagine you're him. 
and you're in your house and you just invited the great teacher, Jesus, to come over. And you've got all your fancy friends sitting around the table. And this woman comes in off the streets. Imagine what she probably looks like, right? She's a street woman, probably torn clothes, probably didn't smell too good. And she, like, it's like a scene there, right? And you're Simon and this is your house. What kinds of thoughts might be running through your mind. Jesus teaches this whole lesson for the sake of Simon. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at the lesson that Jesus has for Simon. And we're going to ask ourselves some hard questions. Number one, let me ask you this. If this woman is the picture of what it looks like when someone's heart is changed by the gospel, could you ever see yourself doing something like she did? Going into someone else's house, if you knew Jesus was there and doing what she did? She's the picture. She's the prototype of what a changed heart looks like. Would you be more like Simon sitting here? Doesn't Jesus know what kind of woman this is? She's a prostitute. I've heard stories of homeless people or prostitutes coming into churches and basically the whole service stops because they expect the pastor to like do something about them. You know that? Which one do you think is more like you? Simon or the woman? We're going to compare Simon to her. And I just want you to be honest and just ask, has the Lord done in my heart what he did in this woman's heart? Is there evidence of it starting? We're going to do that with two points today. Yes, you heard me correctly. I don't have three points today. I only have two points for today. Let's look at them right away. Point number one for today, justification produces sanctification. Here's what I mean in case those words still are a little bit fresh for you. Being declared right with God, that's justification, produces a lifelong process of, listen carefully to these words, changed affections. That's what you're seeing happening here with this woman. A lifelong process of changed affections. And it's starting with her. I'm going to read to you the uh, verses 41 through 47 where Jesus gives the lesson. And I'm going to give kind of a running commentary. So we're going to have lots of pauses, okay? I'm going to explain it as it goes along. Look back with me at verse 41 through 47, and I'm going to give you a running commentary, okay? Here we go. Verse 41, this is Jesus teaching the lesson to Simon. A certain money lender had two debtors. Stop right there. Who's the money lender? It's God. God is the money lender. Both these people in Jesus' story have a debt to God. One owed 500 denarii. That's the woman. She owes a lot. And the other, 50. That's Simon. He sees himself as not owing a whole lot to God. Not in comparison to this woman anyway. Keep reading. When they could not pay, that means both of these people came before the money lender and they realized... I don't have enough to pay you. What are we going to do? He tells them. When they could not pay, he, the money lender, canceled the debt of both. What is that? Justification. You're made right in God's court of law. He forgave their debt. Now, which of them will he love more? Jesus says to Simon. Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. Who's that? The woman, right? And he said to him, You've judged rightly. And now what you're going to see next is Jesus explains, this woman is the one debtor and you're the other debtor. Listen carefully. Then turning toward the woman, after he's done the lesson, he turns to the woman. He's like, Simon, look at the woman. Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. What is that? Faith in action. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. What is that? Changed affections. Kissing his feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. What is that? New priorities. Do you know how expensive that ointment was? You think she was a rich woman? She sold her body on the street. She certainly had new priorities here, didn't she? Keep reading. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. 
for she loved much. She's being changed from the inside out. It concludes like this. But he who is forgiven little, Simon, this is you, loves little. Jesus told this parable so that Simon would compare himself to the woman. Do you see that now? Isn't it obvious? So that's what God is asking us to do with our remaining time here together. When we do, all I want you to do is compare yourself to Simon and the woman. Because that's why it's in your Bible. First, let's start with the woman, shall we? I put a little drawing of her up on the screen so you can get a picture of what this must have looked like. I really hope that you've put yourself around this dinner table. Here's what Jesus says about her. The final declaration he makes about this woman. This is shocking. He says, therefore I tell you her sins which are many. Before I even read the rest, I know a woman who says, God could never forgive me because my sins are too many. I know her. She's in my own family. If you're here this morning, do you think you have more than her? Keep reading. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Now, I, you've got to focus on this last statement right there, because it's really easy to misunderstand this. And if you do, it could have some big problems. Doesn't it seem like he's saying, because she loved so much and did this kind of act of love, washing his feet, doesn't it seem like he's saying, because she did that, that's why her sins are forgiven? Hmm. Huh. You could really read that into there. So because I did the stuff the acts of love, then God forgave me. That's not what Jesus is saying here. This word for right here, this isn't a really good English translation, I got to tell you. This word should be therefore. Read it now with the word therefore. I tell you her sins which are many are forgiven, therefore she loved much. Doesn't that change things a bit? She's forgiven, so she did this great act of love. She wasn't forgiven because she did these acts of love. That changes everything. If you're not going to be forgiven by God unless you do a whole bunch of stuff, well, then guess what? We just got a religion of works. And if you don't do enough stuff, you don't get into heaven. That's not what he's saying here. As a matter of fact, I put a couple of other translations for you up on the screen so you can see for yourself. The CSV translated it like this. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. Really different, isn't it? The NIV, I think, also captures this pretty well. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. I hope you see the difference there. I want to give you a little illustration of what Jesus is trying to help us understand. Between you and me, let's make this personal, okay? Imagine that you owed me a debt of a lot of money, a whole lot of money that you couldn't pay. And you came to me and our relationship had kind of been strained because you felt bad that you couldn't pay me and so you just stopped talking to me. And so I was upset about it and I saw you and I said, listen, I'll tell you what, if you go paint my house, I'll forgive the debt. And so you say, fine, it's a deal and we shake on it. And then you go off and you paint my house. When you're all done, can I ask you an obvious question? Would you have any new affections for me? Or have I shown you anything gracious in that moment? No. All I did was got what you owed me through labor rather than cash. We just changed the bargain. I got what I deserved. I had you, instead of giving me the cash, I just had you go paint my house. And then we had a deal, and off you go. And we still have kind of a strained relationship. That's what religion is all about. You do a little and God will forgive you. That's not what Jesus is saying here. This is the better analogy. You owed me some money. Our relationship was strained because you felt bad about it. So you hadn't talked to me for a while. We were separated because of it. I saw you on the street one day and I came over to you and I said, I love you so much. I really miss you. I'm going to absorb the debt myself. You owe me nothing. Nothing. And you're like, that's a lot of money. You owe me nothing. I love you more than I love the money. I love you. And then I walk away. You leave there with tears streaming down your face. I hope you would. He forgave me of all that even though I did nothing to deserve it. So here's what you do. You're riding your bicycle past my house one day while I'm on vacation. You're like, this house needs a good painting. I think I'm going to go paint his house and surprise him so that when he gets home. Totally different, isn't it? 
those things, those new affections stirred up good works that came out of you. The good works didn't come because you were obligated to give it to me. Do you see the difference? That's what Jesus is trying to get Simon to understand, but he's like totally blind and deaf to it. Do you see? He's trying to get this Simon to look at this woman and see this in her. Do you see it? He's trying to see how someone is forgiven. Do you see it? Because I know many Christians who go through their life never really understanding the gospel. They think that if I don't do the stuff, God won't love me. If I'm good, he loves me. If I'm bad, he doesn't love me anymore. That's not the gospel. He has forgiven you because he loves you. That's the root of real change in a person's heart. That's the root of sanctification. He loved you enough to change you when you were still a sinner. If you're still trying to work hard enough to make God love you, I'm telling you, here's what's going to happen. You know what that will result in? You'll hate God. It drives you away from God. If you think, if, God, if I do good stuff, God will love me, then when you don't do the good stuff, what do you think God thinks about you? He doesn't love me anymore. He's angry at me. And so the, the wedge gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Listen to me. What kind of response would you think should come from a person who God says, you are still a sinner, but while you're still a sinner, I will send my son to die for you. What kind of response would come from a person who's forgiven of their sins while they're still in the midst of doing sins? This woman, you fall on your face with tears flowing down. You'd forgive me? You'd, do you know what I've done with my life? You'd forgive me? She's the picture of a person who can be forgiven while they're still sinners. I want to tell you something. If you have struggled with this, before we move on to what Simon looks like, if you think that God is not pleased with you and you're a Christian, I want to settle that for you right now. God spoke out from the clouds when Jesus was baptized. He was baptized and they heard a voice coming from heaven. And he said this, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well well pleased. If you are in Christ, that's what it means to be a Christian, then God sees you as if he's seeing his Son. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Not because of anything that you've done, but because of what he has done. Do you understand? He's pleased with you because of the work of his son. That makes the gospel different from anything else you've ever heard in your life. Now let's take a look at Simon for just a minute, okay? Why Simon couldn't understand what Jesus was saying. Let's look at the implication Jesus makes about Simon here in verse 47. So first he talks about the woman. He says, therefore I tell you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. That's her, right? Now he talks about Simon. But he who is forgiven little loves little. What does he mean, he who's forgiven little loves little? Does that mean Simon has very little to be forgiven of? No. This is a Pharisee. This is the one whom Jesus said, they have the most to be forgiven of. They're the ones who are blind and deaf. So how can he say, Simon, he who has been forgiven little loves little. Here's what he means. Simon, you think you have such little to be forgiven of, so you don't acknowledge that you have a lot to be forgiven of. So you never ask for it. You ever known someone like that? Someone who compares themselves to other people, and so they think, I'm better than him, or I'm better than her, so I don't have as much to be forgiven of as a prostitute, or the guy, my husband, he's the one who's really got to ask for forgiveness. Or my wife, Lord, do you hear the way she talks to me? I don't have to ask for forgiveness as much as she does. That's Simon's mindset. So he doesn't ask for forgiveness very often. And what's the result? He doesn't get sanctified. He's not made holy. I want to give you a little illustration of someone that I know that maybe will help you to think of how this is playing out with Jesus and Simon. There's a man who I know, I've known him most of my life, and uh, he's just been considered by everybody to be a Boy Scout. Everything he does is just good. He's just a good guy. He's faithful to his family, loves his kids, he serves in his church. Um, He's trusted by everyone. He's never, ever once lost his temper, as far as I can remember. Just a good guy. You'd love this guy. 
He's a Christian. But here's the thing. Because he's always been like this, a Boy Scout, and I remember his teachers would always say, you should try to be more like this guy. He's never really seen himself as bad as other people. He's a Christian. He's, he knows he's a sinner in need of a Savior. But here's the problem. When other people don't live up to that same standard that he set for himself, he has a really hard time forgiving them. He has a really hard time letting people go when they've committed sins against him. And sometimes he just kind of cuts those people off. He's not mean or nasty about it, but when someone is rude or they've done something wrong, he just kind of cuts them off. Because he doesn't see them as being, he doesn't see himself as being as bad as they are. And he has no tolerance for people who don't meet his same standard. That's like Simon. So, what do you think happens at the end result of a person like that? What will be the end result of someone who's just kind of been status quo their entire life? There's no transformation. There's no growth because they don't think they need it. They always see themselves as the standard, the good one in the family, the good one in the classroom, the good one in the church. And so they stay like this their whole time. Let me tell you what happens, something I've seen in church my whole life. And you tell me if you've seen anything like this. Someone like this person who I just mentioned to you, they're sitting in church somewhere, and they're watching someone else, like this woman, sitting up in front of the church, and she's weeping because she knows she's a sinner. And as she's singing, she might even fall to her knees, and she raises her hand, and she just, she's broken down by the truth of the gospel. And the person in the back, I've heard this with my own ears. I've heard it. Someone says, what false humility. What a show. She just wants people to look at her. It's not real. Why? Because they don't see themselves as she sees herself. As a, sin- a sinner in need of tremendous grace from God. And so what does this person do? They see themselves as a mediocre sinner. My sin isn't really that offensive to God. So my Christian worship is just what? mediocre it just stays like this flatline throughout the entire life never any growth trajectory at all because they don't think they need it she needs it she does she's the one who deserves to worship like that she should do that me i'm like simon i'm the good one are light bulbs starting to go off if you see yourself And the lavishness of your sin, like this woman did, what will be the result? Lavish love for God. But if you see your sin as not so lavish, what will be the result? A not so lavish love for God. And a mediocre relationship with Him their entire life. So how do you think it will end for a woman like this? A person who's been set on this trajectory of change, where she has new heart with new affections that are growing every day for God. That's point number two. Take a look up on the screen. Our final point for today. Sanctification results in transformation. Let me explain. Changed affections, that's what sanctification is. A heart that's being changed will result in a changed, hear hear this word, identity. That's the truth of the New Testament. That this process that has started will result in a whole new identity. Look at verses 48 through 50. Look at what Jesus says about this woman. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? This last statement is really important. And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now I'd like to devote the remainder of our time together, the last few minutes, on that last little part. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Why do you think Jesus says that she should go in peace? Isn't it obvious? Take a look at this word saved. It's in the past tense. Do you know why? Because according to Jesus, the way that he sees her now, this is a finished, completed thing. I know most Christians who would never use the word saved in a sentence because they don't believe it's done, declared already. They think, if I don't continue to do the good stuff, then I just won't be saved anymore. That's not the way Jesus sees this woman, is it? He calls her a saved person. Finished. He sees her as an already finished, completed assignment. 
Do you see how great this news is? That Jesus can literally stamp you saved, declare it as already done? She has a new identity according to Jesus. She's not seen as that old street woman any longer. This is great news, I think. So why does he tell her to go in peace? Let's be honest here for just a second, okay? If you were a prostitute and you knew that you had to walk out of here and go back to that, those streets where you once walked, you know what men are going to say when they see you, right? Men that you've maybe been with and they see that you've cleaned up and changed your life. Do you think they'll acknowledge it? Nope. Nope. They're going to see you as that same old filthy prostitute that you always were. And that's the label that they'll have for you for the rest of your life. So she has a choice to make, doesn't she? Am I going to believe the word that comes from others? Am I going to believe the word that comes from my own mind of who I see when I look in the mirror? That prostitute who I don't even like to look at anymore? Or am I going to believe the word that came from Christ about my identity? She has a choice. So why can she go in peace? Because she knows no matter what anyone says about me, no matter if I'm killed for my faith, which was highly likely, my sins are forgiven. So when I die, I know that I'll be made right with God. That's why she can go forward in peace. The person who continues on this trajectory of this new life of faith, someone who's been saved, and they're seeing evidences of these new affections stirring up for God, this is what the Bible says about that person. 2 Corinthians 5.17. We write songs about this because it's such great news. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do you know last week we baptized eight people? Out in the ocean, we baptized eight people. My son was one of them. My sister was another one. And what that symbolized when they went under the water is that old life has been been crucified with Christ. And the person who comes out of the water is a new creation. Now, do you think that means my son is never going to sin again? He's 10. He's got his teenage years ahead of him. Of course not. But what it means is that that old person, that old life has died with Christ. Out of the water comes a new Logan Fraser. That's my son's name, Logan. Out of the water comes a new Logan Fraser. And in his heart, a change has been done and new affections are going to start to grow because he confessed his faith in Jesus Christ. His love for God will grow. His love for the things God loves will grow. And what will be the end result of this lifetime of growth? He will become the new creation God declared him to be. A butterfly, something that once was one thing and changed into something totally new. A metamorphosis is happening in my son. Is it happening in you? Have you seen evidences of these new affections growing in your heart? What would you do if Jesus came over to your Thanksgiving dinner with all your family sitting around your table? Would you do what this woman did? Are there evidences of a love for God growing in your heart? Something we all have to consider on a daily basis. You can close your Bibles. I want to leave you with a a challenge. The challenge is to begin to see yourself the way that Jesus saw this woman. Every single one of us, when we wake up in the morning, we have a decision about what to believe. More properly, who to believe. Most of us will go throughout our day believing our own inner dialogue. You know what I mean by that? What I say about myself. If I messed up, you ever have conversations with yourself? You're such a buffoon. You're such a loser. Why would you do things like that? And you put all these labels on yourself? Are you going to say for the rest of your life what you say about you? Or are you going to say what Christ says about you? That you are a new creation. That you have been made a royal priesthood. Someone who is not that filthy person you once were, but someone who is in the process of being made new. Here's why this matters as we close. What you... What you believe in your life, whoever's word you believe, you're being transformed into. Do you know that? If you believe those things about your old life are still true today, you will eventually find that at the end of your life, you've been transformed into those old things. But if you believe what Christ says about you is true, 
then you will be transformed into exactly who he says you are. And that is the glorious news of the gospel of our Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, truly there is nothing more glorious in all the world than to know that we can be made into new creations. That we can be changed from the inside out. I pray for every person here that we would follow in the footsteps of this woman who had new affections, new priorities, new love for Jesus. I pray that every one of us here would begin to grow in our relationship with Him, loving what He loves and hating what He hates. I pray that not just for these people, but for me and my family also. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you all stand with me as we close? Sometimes it's good to close with a closing song. Sometimes it's good to close with a benediction. It's the way services used to close. And there is a perfect benediction that Paul prayed over a church that I'd like to pray over you as we leave here today. I put it up on the screen for you. Would you take a look? It's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And He is coming soon. Amen? God bless you all. Go, go in the grace and peace of the Lord.